Hey everyone, Ariel Adams here with the Superlative Podcast. Be sure to listen to the other a blog to watch podcast, a blog to watch weekly, where we cover the latest watch news. My guest today on Superlative is VJ Geronimo, CEO of Oris Americas. VJ, welcome. Nice to be here, Ariel. Nice to see you again, and thank you for having me on, on the show. Yeah, thanks for coming here. You're you're one of the guys in charge, so you got to be here <laughs> to chat with the, the community. I um I found out something interesting recently about the listenership of Superlative. And, uh, and a blog to watch weekly for that matter. A lot of industry folks who may be used to browse blog articles and things like that are now using podcasts to get, you know, their news. You're, you're working in the industry. You're kind of busy. Yeah. You can't read all the articles or so much. So podcasts, in addition to, you know, the people that buy watches listing to them is now something for the industry to listen to. So this is one way for you and your colleagues to speak to one another, you know, at, coincidentally, right? Certainly. No, it's, yeah, it's definitely, obviously, with the way that media has changed and things have changed, there's definitely different ways of getting info. Um, and certainly, you know, podcasts are certainly one of the ways that I do too. I also, yeah, obviously, Instagram is a way also of getting a lot of news and seeing what was going on as well. So it's interesting uh, how that's changed over time. Now, you have always been a big supporter of watches and media. And what I mean by that is you understand inherently the coverage and getting in front of people in the United States is is really, really crucial. You're a fan, of course, of events. You're a fan, of course, of social media. Talk a little bit about explaining that to the Swiss, because I know you have a very personal and close relationship uh, with the people in Switzerland at Oris. Talk a little bit about what you say to them when you're encouraging them to embrace media in a way that maybe only an American can, you know? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think, you know, and talked about, you know, being in front of watch people and watch media. And I think the great thing about Oris is our independence, right? It had always been our independence. So, I mean, the ability to think about things and the ability to do things that maybe some other people wouldn't do, you know, right away until it's fully accepted by the industry or do something like that. So we've always been someone that's kind of been out into the, into the front of doing things like that. And, 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 you know, obviously, you know, um, our Swiss organization, you know, Rolf Studer, our global CEO, who's, you know, just really, the most open person when it comes to kind of thinking about new things and, and accepting new, um, not technologies, but basically new ways of doing it. So like when we talk about what we're going to do, we always try to do things that maybe are a little bit outside of the box or do things that are a little bit different going forward. So, I mean, I think part of that, the ability to do that is definitely the relationship that you have with this, with our Swiss, um, with our Swiss folks, with, with Rolf and Ulrich, our executive chairman as well. Um, you know, we've always had a great relationship and that's allowed us to do that sort of thing. So in thinking about some of the more impactful marketing things that Oris has done here in the United States, around the world, I couldn't say because I'm not there. Uh, I know it's popular in other markets, um, but I'm just sort of going through some of the list. Uh, you embraced baseball in a big way when really no one else was. And I don't think the Swiss really understand baseball, baseball fandom in America because if you don't live, if you don't grow up around it, it's a niche thing, but it's a very intense thing. It's yeah. hard to understand, right? If you're not, if you don't see it next to you, especially in, uh, you know, the New England area and all that where you are. Um, yeah. Then you did these, these in-person events in a sort of novel way. You, you got the Airstream that you sort of decked a few airstreams, I think. And the idea yep, was to make, was to do a road trip, take, you know, take the watches with you, traveling showroom. Um, those, you know, I, I think you still use them, of course, but that was a very uh, good and useful idea. Doing something that, again, wouldn't make sense in Europe. You just couldn't really store something like that or move it around in a lot of places, but it Correct. works here. I saw, and I want, actually, I want to chat about this a lot, is country music. Um, yep. I know you started doing a little bit in, in working with that world, which is, it's not new for the watch industry to work with music, but the subgenre of country music in the United States has been relatively untouched. I think you sort of opened up their minds to it. So you're not going to be alone there for very long, but you've, um, you've been able to try these areas and others and others, of course, where others haven't, I, I, I suspect this is you and your team. Um, I mean, you know, uh, do are, do you get credit for for these activations that no one else would have thought of but you? Yeah, I mean, I think certainly we, you know, we we try to do these things, and 
I think the really important part about it is the acceptance of these things with our, with our Swiss organization as well. And, you know, we always say like, do things that feel right or do things that, that make sense to us. And that's kind of what we, the, the, the mantra and the genre, the things that we've been allowed to follow. So, yeah, I mean, it's, I don't think it's a secret that I'm a big baseball fan, um, you know, or, or a big country music fan for that matter. Um, but certainly, you know, Rolf is on, on my, you know, on our group, uh, Josh is, you know, we're, we're all in that, in that section. So we, we really have followed things that are, that are there. I mean, the baseball thing has been very, very good in the sense of, Obviously, you know, building awareness for the brand. I mean, I think that was one of the main reasons why we why we did it. Um, and then as it's evolved over time, obviously, the New York Yankees was our first kind of um, foray into that. And, you know, the Yankees are the Yankees, but they're also a very much a global brand. So I think the fact that that, that was available and the acceptance of of sort of the Yankee, the New York Yankee mark as uh, as something, I think that that played a lot into kind of us getting involved in it. Then when we made product, we wanted to make product around baseball, but we wanted to do it in a way that was very Oris, right? So it was, we made a couple of limited edition watches based on um, players. And yes, they were great players and legacy players and all Hall of Fame players in baseball. But the the real reason why we made those things was because of um you know, their legacy, their humanitarian legacy. So Roberto Clemente, Hank Aaron, the Roberto Clemente Foundation, the Hank Aaron Chasing the Dream Foundation. It was those things that really drove us to the, to that side of it. So, um, you know, we really just try to take a fresh look at it. But yes, I mean, I, I, I'm fortunate in the fact that ideas do get, do get, um, accepted and, and kind of brought forth. So, you know, and I think that's true in a lot of, a lot of things. So. How do you explain to the Swiss the sometimes difficult to digest notion that in America, consumers, it's sometimes less about product and more about a relationship with the brand. And if the brand makes them feel good and supports the things they like, they're oftentimes happy to you know, wear that brand if they can afford it, of course. Whereas the Swiss sometimes tend to hyper-focus on the brand's uh, desirability of the products and how people choose their watch over others. And there's, you know, there's a disconnect because, yes, while a real deep enthusiast is going to choose a specific timepiece, I'd say a lot of the more mainstream luxury watch consumers in America are seeking experience more so than anything. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I agree with you. But I would say that um, when we talk about Swiss and, you know, I'll say um, my Swiss, as I like to say, my Swiss understand that very, very much, actually. <laughs> <laughs> my Swiss are... Um, you know, they're great with regard to community engagement, with regard to understanding the experience someone has. Like our whole notion as a brand is and our whole thing is to make people smile. Like that's what we see. Like as we as we always say, like we're we're with mechanical watches here and they're really not anything anybody needs. This is not an object of, of something that's going to save your life tomorrow. And you know what, you know, you never know, but I'm just saying in, in a general sense of the imagine in general sense of the word, like it's not something you need. So it really is all about emotion and connecting with people and connecting to things that they, they like or having those things. So certainly we've been very actively trying to do things and give people experiences around that. If you look at, you know, the stuff obviously we've done with the Airstreams, but if you look at our, our boutiques throughout the world, you know, in Switzerland, especially like they're very involved in the community. They, they host events, they host things for the community. Um, they really try to do that. And I think that's, that's really what sets Aura's apart, I think is that ability to do that and just be approachable be ourselves and be able to, um, you know, welcome people and understand it's about the people. Go in a little bit more in discussing the importance of the relationship of the brand and the people, because I think that that's been such a crucially defining element of the watch market today. Because again, like when I became a watch lover, it was me looking through information, deciding what watch was right for me. Now it's so much different than that. It's not only that are there more options? But now I try to think about what community is right for me, what brand is right for me, what style is right for me. And the only way that people figure that stuff out is through these in-person interactions is often. And so by facilitating people to get together, as you mentioned, you know, Oris is involved with the community, you 
you create the culture that then creates the basis for you know, buying these products. But first, brands must create that culture. Oris, in its own way, has been doing that for very many years. And I'd like for you to talk a little bit more about how you see the personal importance of that, because it's not enough these days just to be like, hey, we have a great watch. You have to have a lot of other things. And I think that's so crucial to any brand's, not just success, but performance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, I think personally, you know, being with Oris for almost 15 years, right, and kind of seeing the transition of just things over time with regard to media and the way people kind of talk about watches or see watches and how they, you know, consume their media. But I'll tell you, like when, when Oris was in our early days, um, you know, 12 years ago or so, um, in our earlier days, we basically, there were people that didn't know what Oris was. And the fact that there was this whole community of people, um, that, you know, watch enthusiasts, as we'll say, that knew Oris and loved Oris. And, you know, that's how we first got involved with kind of doing these events and getting involved with Red Bar very early on, like, and, and doing, you know, in-person things like that was because just there was a general understanding and a general, um, you know, mutual understanding of, hey, we like your watches and let's, let's do more about it. And then I personally thought that it wasn't just about you know, one particular place. It wasn't about New York being the center of everything in the world. Like there's people all over the country. And especially when we were a brand that, um, you know, we had retail distribution, but we, you know, it wasn't what it is today. So there were places in the country that never have never got to see a, a Oris in person or people. So I always made it a point to go out and do events and, and have our group do events in places where not everybody was doing events because then it kind of, you know, it really kind of was able to bring, bring what we had to the people, so to say. And that's, and that's really kind of, um, the philosophy we always try to keep and really get out there and, and make people, um, you know, let people see the product, let people see what they may not normally see and, and do it in a way that wasn't pretentious or stuffy or anything, just really just be ourselves and be able to host things and, and you know, make it simple for people and make people feel comfortable. You've had the interesting experience many times now, and this is going along with what we said, of introducing not just the Oris brand to people, but watch collecting as a hobby overall. Because as you said, finding these um, less trafficked by luxury brands part of the United States, you're reaching consumers who can afford the prices of luxury watches, but simply don't really know the depth of this hobby. And you get to introduce this hobby to people. And I'm really curious about that because you've done it now probably many, many times. What's What are some best practices, right? You're talking to someone. You don't want to intimidate them with all the nerdiness that can come into this. How do you start talking about watches to get them thinking the way that they should to appreciate it, you know? Like, in a, you know, in a place where someone maybe comes for the first time and, and ta- you know, that's what you're trying to say, like, maybe is, is very new to it and sees, like, if there's an event going on and then, I'm, hey, at first time I'm at a watch event, yeah. what am I doing, that sort of thing, yeah. I mean, I think there's a lot of people like that. Like, there's still today, there's a lot of people like, oh, you know, it's a my lot, first wa- watch event, right? No, and I think it's just not being judgmental, I think, is the first really part about it that's very important. I mean, I think if people come in and they feel judged and, you know, I think it's with anything in life, right? If you don't know about um, watch collecting and you're coming in and trying to learn and someone is judgmental of you because you don't know anything about watches, like that's that that's going to turn anybody off, right? And I think it's just being normal people, trying to be normal people and try to be accepting of all people and, and you know, whether they're wearing a, you know, a $10 watch or a hundred thousand dollar watch. I mean, I think they're wearing a watch and that's, and that's really, um, the first step is really being, um, accepting and non-judgmental of people. And then obviously talking about Oris, talking about our brand, talking about what we stand for, um, accessible price points are certainly something that, you know, appeal to people and people can relate to. Um, so I think that's kind of where we start and how we do it. And then just, you know, just have a good time, like make it, make it fun, not just, you know, a boring, um, reception or something like that, not stuffy. I think that's kind of how we approach it. A lot of people report that. These experiences, you know, the the worst ones of what we're talking about, you're talking about stuff that you're talking about accessible. Um, people are 
intimidated, sometimes threatened, actually, of being in that environment. Um, whether it's someone from a brand and you just simply have no idea what to talk to them about, or it's a retailer who's trying to sell you something, or it's a fellow enthusiast who may have years more experience than you and you don't want to sound like a fool, just feeling comfortable to interact at these shows can be an uphill battle for a lot of new people. If you've been doing it for many years, it might seem second nature to you. Of course, there's also the humorous thing, which you find that a lot of people are naturally gravitated towards watches, may not be the most social to begin with. That by no means defines everyone. So putting them in a room with a bunch of other guys is itself a weird thing, right? <laughs> like right, Whether right. or not it's a topic they like. And icebreakers, making them feel comfortable, super important. So, you know, watch events can really, you know, even if they look good on the outside, the how how successful the chemistry is can really focus on how, how you can make people feel comfortable. So you're right, it's not a specific topic, but making people feel comfortable at sort of the, we'll call it the, the watch brand dinner party is a real art, not a science. Yeah. No, and it's, fu- it's funny that you say that about, you know, you kind of put everybody together and it's, it's, it's there's a lot of people that, it's a it's a haven for them, so to say. It's like a safe place to go because they think that they have um, a problem because they love watches so much and all they want to do is talk about watches. So they find more people. Like some people are really like, you know, it's it's a place that they love to go to and, and do that. And then there's the other people that you kind of see and they bring a they bring a significant other with them to this, and the significant other may like may or may not like watches, right? So there's this like this thing that they're they're either they're liking watches or they're they're supporting their their partner and they're kind of just going through the motions of it but whatever but i always laugh because there's always a sense of like when someone had in that situation and all of a sudden the significant other that doesn't like watches says like oh i like that or something they're like all right i gotta get that i got it like it's like this immediate like there's like an <laughs> inkling of liking of something and then they're like they go you know they they really are into it and they have to like get it for them the kind of thing so it's 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 uh having seen that it's it's actually very it's heartwarming to see and it's it's nice to see so well the interesting thing about watches and we sometimes forget this as obvious as it is is when done well the products have beauty in addition to functionality and when you think about the various types of we'll call them brand events an American consumer might be invited to, very rarely is related to a product that is both beautiful and you can wear, right? Maybe it's a guy's at a car event, but, you know, it's a car, you can't really take it with you. Watches have the ability to delight on an emotional and visceral level, whereas an event for just a mere tool cannot. And so if you actually are charmed by that watch and you find a model that you like, you can get excited in a way that is uncommon at your typical consumer meets brand product event. You know what I mean? Right. Very much. Very much. And that's, and that's, and that, but that's, and that's ultimately you want is you want someone to, I mean, it sounds awkward to find a watch and fall in love with it. And then yep. cho- say, I want that. I formed the design. <laughs> I want that thing. I love, I want to yeah. own it. Maybe other yeah. people also have one, but I want mine. And yeah. That's the trigger. That's the thing you want to trigger to get them down the, the I guess we'll call it the purchase path, right? Yeah. And it's, you know, and honestly, when we do these events, like it's not really, it, I never view them as a selling event per se, right? It's a, they're, they're always like, for the most part, it's an introduction to something that maybe people don't see or whatever. You guys yes, don't obvi- push hard at all. You guys yeah. are like this, the easiest, like you're like, oh, you want to see the watches? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not like it's, 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 it's just like we, you do it. Yes. And of course, there's times when you're in an environment that, things are sell, you know, it's a selling environment, but still it's, it is that emotional connection. I think that's, that's the important part of it. And I think that's really what, what, you know, you establish with the watches and, you know, I think it's a very personal thing too. Like some people, you either love something or you, you don't like something and it's, it really is just a personal thing. So if if you find something you really like, whether it's an Oris or some other, you know, if you really like it, that's good. That, 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 is what the hobby is going to be and continue for, for, for a long time, you know? 
So I'm going to change topic a little bit, talk about the Oris brand. I want to get a little bit <clears throat> in the background, not everything. Um, and I want to start with a story from not too long ago. I was in Geneva and I was having dinner with a few people. And at the table was someone who, amongst other things, is a watchmaker <clears throat> and whose family has been selling watches. And this person was wearing an Oris on one of their wrists. They had uh, two wrists, different watches. And I was like, oh, um, I noticed your Oris, you know. <clears throat> and then he starts saying how his family store for many years sold Oris and they also worked on Oris watches. And I was interested because this was in Switzerland, which is, of course, a very different market than America. Oris has been sold in Switzerland, you know, a lot longer. Sure. And he was saying that for many years, the, the allure of Oris was as this no-nonsense watch that was a watch, did all the things right, but you didn't pay more than you needed. It, was, it wasn't a budget watch, but it was a fair, a fair watch. They sort of average Joe or family knew what they were getting. There was consistency. There was a high degree of trust. Anything that's interesting to let people know, at least from what I could tell, was the sort of foundational personality of the brand as it sort of entered the modern era and as it grew. Um, what else would you add, VJ, about the historic personality of the brand, what it was known for? Because in the modern era, everyone's a luxury brand. I get that. But there's history where it wasn't Nobody, you know, asked someone in, in the early days, what is Oris? And I don't know that anyone said like, oh, we're a luxury watchmaking company. Like they would have said yeah. something different. Yeah. I mean, I think, the, you know, the, the company was founded upon the principle of bringing a good watch to a large amount of people. Like we were never going to be the, you know, very limited edition production, hand painted movement company um, that was never in you know, the philosophy of us, um, you know, from the beginning till, till now, it was more about really making a good watch for the money, like being reasonable and fair with pricing and just, you know, telling, bringing it to, to bringing it out there. And, you know, there's so many people I hear in a lot of different countries, like my first watch, my first watch was an Oris or I've had this Oris, um, you know, for a long time, or my dad had one or my grandpa had one. Like there's certainly all these things that you hear about Oris, but yeah, it was always this, the, the, the basic philosophy of the company was a strong watch, well made for the price and for, for good money. And, uh, that's kind of where, that's kind of where it is. And that's where it continues to, to say that industrial approach to manufacturing still exists today and it's still something that we we kind of go through you know talk about the interesting and again evolving evolving i think that's the crucial word sweet spot which is the integration of we make a fair product for the money and yeah we're a luxury good because a lot of companies in the space have to ride this awkwardly fine line between the two right because it yeah. is decidedly a luxury good Decidedly, all of this stuff is anything over a few hundred bucks is decidedly a luxury good. Yeah. But at the same time, you're not selling on, hey, wear your bling out in public. No, right. And I think it's, you know, it's, it's, it is something, it's all relative. I mean, I, I mean, sometimes in our world, we all get jaded because we're dealing with, you know, 2000 to $20,000 products. And we're like, oh, it's just that, it's just a couple, you know, but the, that's, hard earned money for a lot of people. Like that's, that's, yeah. a, that's something that people will put out there. So it's like, you have to consider that and you have to always consider that that's, that's what it is. But, um, you know, I think the luxury side of it, I mean, I think having something that is reason, you know, again, being of, it could be, you know, priced at $3,000 and still have a extraordinary relative value to other things. And I think that's still where we, we exist, right? So yes, it's a luxury good, maybe because of the price point that it is, because at this moment it is, it, it's become more luxury because it is again, not something anybody needs, right? That what's the definition of luxury, right? It's like, it's a luxury. It's not a necessity, right? So like, that's certainly something that people, um, again, don't need, but it's like, how do we, continue to bring that value driven product. And we do. And the other thing that it should be considered just in the industry in general is just the way that, you know, Swiss goods and, and the currency have changed over time. I mean, when I first started my career in the watch industry, you know, how many years ago, a lot of years ago, like the U S dollar was worth, you know, um, 1.5, there were 1.5 Swiss francs to the U S dollar. Like, and that was, and now it's like 
point eight what is it lately point eight three so I mean right. that in itself like and you look at the pricing and the relative pricing of goods like that in itself has had such a huge um, impact on the price of price of uh, watches and price of uh, price of luxury items especially watches coming from Switzerland so in terms of the positioning of the brand as still a good value for what you get still focused on someone who works hard for their money. How closely aligned is Aura still with that message that it was known for for so many years? I mean, I think we are we are still aligned with that, right? I think it's we always try to build value into our products or I should say, you know, strong value into our products with things that make sense, complications that make sense. Um, you know, obviously with the advent of our Caliber 400 series and our own in-house movements, um our average price point has come up a bit, you know, depending. We still obviously make a lot of Salida based product, but with Caliber 400, it's come up. But when we look at Caliber 400, yes, it's not, it, it may have taken us out of a very entry level realm, but the value of that still exists. Five day power reserve, 10 year warranty, 10 year service interval, those things are still industry leading in the sense of, you know, bring something very strong for the, for the money. And I think that's, I don't think we've lost that at all. Thinking about the fact that both you and I have been doing this for well over a decade now, uh, we've noticed some trends and stuff like that. And I wanted your opinion on a trend that I found interesting to say the least. And let's sort of flash back a little bit. And it has to do with, I'll call the futuristic versus retro or vintage design. Um, 10 years ago, maybe even a little bit longer, you look at the Oris collection and you had a split. You had stuff that, yeah, that was looked like yesterday. I, I wouldn't say it was the majority of the collection. Then you had some contemporary stuff and then you even had some futuristic stuff. Yep. Nowadays, you look at the catalogs of most watch brands, uh, especially ones at Oris price points, and they've all sort of reverted to a very sort of vintage forward, forward aesthetic. It's interesting to me that despite the advancement of time, right now, cultural trends tend, tend to be into sort of vintage, vintage design, even though I think a lot of modern futuristic designs are not only competent, but really, really cool. What, are your, what is your take on the persistent interest in new watches with older designs and, you know, at the exact same time, futuristic designs and mechanical watches, for whatever reason, don't do as well right now? What, what, what is your take on all that? Yeah, it, it is an interesting point that you make. And I think, you know, having done this for a bit of time and seeing sort of the trend, like I, I do think like 2014, 10 years ago, right? Diver 65 was launched, like our Diver 65. So that was kind of our first retro vintage product, right? And that was like, did extreme, like I, 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 I view that as a turning point or like a, a milestone in our modern history of kind of Oris putting Oris on the map and really kind of bringing us out there. So I think the vintage trend kind of started at that time, you know, um, or right around that time. And I think, you know, I think people like people have grown to like that. I think to your point in modern culture, you know, you look at things like, you know, vinyl records and you look at things like, there everything is making sort of a, a comeback right everything is making so that 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 need for or that desire for vintagey things it doesn't surprise me that those designs are popular in the sense of of the watch of our watch products right so uh, i see it and it's still it does still continue and you know as with anything there's trends right so there's trends and stuff so there's still a continuation of that vintage looking trend but also from our perspective as a brand, you know, it's nice to have the heritage and the catalog to go back to, to say, okay, we made this watch in 1965, or we made this watch in 19, you know, 98 or something like that. We've had that history and heritage. Not everybody has, um, that, that stuff, especially with a lot of the newer brands that have come out. But, um, yeah, I think it, I think it's interesting and I, I like it, Ariel. I like, I, I, I like the vintage side of things. Like, I think it's really, um, it's, 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 it's a good way to kind of look at the product, you know, 
You've seen both types of buyers, the, the situation where they buy the more modern design. You, of course, still have the Pro Pilot X, which I would call the modern watch. Yep. And you've also seen, of course, the vintage person. My question is, is there something different about the buyer or is it different circumstance? Meaning it's the same buyer that could buy both, but something about their lives and their mentality pushes them in one direction or the other. Yeah, I think it's. I think it, it can be the same buyer. Yeah. Um, I think I, I really do think it can be. I think just people like, you know, maybe they want something that's um, uh, maybe it depends on their wrist, what their wrist size, what they're wearing, um, you know, their 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 choice of their fashion choices, things like that. People make those kind of choices, but I think, you know, not everyone appreciates like the the futuristic forward PPX like in the in the design that it is and 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 the way it is, but. You know, then I look at like our skeleton, um, the PPX caliber 115, and I look at that, and that's a very popular watch. Um, and so a lot of people also gravitate to that who are wearing Diver 65s or wearing, you know, big crown pointed dates. Like I still see a lot of that as well. So yeah, I think it's, I think it can be the same buyer. Um, and again, I think it just comes down to personal taste. So, so- Oh, this is interesting. I want to keep talking about this because I find the process, at least from the brand side, fascinating. So you notice that the market likes vintage. And if you're an older brand, you have, as you said, back catalogs to go back to be like, oh, people are in a vintage. Let's let's find some authentic vintage stuff for us and sort of remake it. But, you know, you take that for a few years, you extend it out. Eventually, you sort of run out of satisfying things to remake and then you have to ask yourself the word question. Okay, we still want to make things people want, obviously. Uh, we don't want to just keep regurgitating what we've done. How do we make new vintage? Do we look at what's popular in the market? Do we imagine a watch that looks vintage that never existed? It, it, it puts designers who have to make novel stuff in kind of a, a tricky position, right? Yeah, and I, th- I think it's, uh, it, is an interesting, it is an interesting point. And I think, like... It, I think we're almost at that point too, where we're getting to the point of like vintage designs and things like that. So how do you do it? And I think you have to interpret, you take some cues from your vintage side, but also make it into a modern product, right? Like when we first, um, you know, and I think you'll see like some of the new stuff we have or just is coming out, like our new divers, um, they take into account, they kind of have a nod to the, to the past, but they also, are 200 meter water resistant. They, you know, have longer power reserves. They have things like that. So things you would expect in a modern watch, but also have a little bit of a of a of a, a backwards look at the at the design aesthetic. So I mean, that's the funny thing that I think is is should be said for those that it's not clear. Even though people have a interest in vintage style, very few people actually want vintage watches or want to perform like vintage watches. They want watches made out of modern materials using modern techniques with modern movements that are more reliable, are more accurate, have longer power reserves, all these things like that. Like the, the demand is thoroughly for a modern product. It's just what it looks like, which is different. It's not how it performed. I think that should be stated for anyone that may misunderstand, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I it's funny, like we talked about our airstreams. I'll give you a good example of, of, of that situation. Like, yeah. So the first, the first airstream, we have three of them. Actually, we have four of them. So the first one we had was a vintage airstream, like a vintage, like an like actual old 1978 one. <laughs> vintage airstream. Right. So it looked cool. It looked all those things, but with it comes the issues of, a leaking windows or like, oh you know, it's got to be like the things like that. So then we decided to make, you know, to take new ones and make them into the, the old. And I think that is exactly the point you were making about kind of the, the functionality and the modern, you know, things of it. And I think that's exactly a great example of how, you know, that came into play for us in, in that situation. It was, we wanted the you know, a reliable vehicle that didn't leak and, you know, everything, the electrical was modern and all this stuff was there, but it still looked, still looked like an Airstream that we, the design that we liked. So, yeah. That's- and, and, and the interesting thing here is it, it kind of attacks some of the weird, I'll call them myths that exist in some of the collector's minds, because sometimes the idea of a vintage watch is, is what I call the found history, found treasure. I am this hunter of cool old things. <laughs> Look at this old watch I found. It's still relevant today. Aren't I a cultured and accomplished chap, right? <laughs> um, 
But at the end of the day, I mean, you're really buying a style because for most people that they don't actually live that lifestyle. They haven't done that. They just want to buy something that looks like it. So I guess it's a fashion play. Yet we can't call it a fashion play. In fact, men especially really don't like thinking of them ever as buying fashion, even that's if, if that's exactly what they're doing. So you have to sort of like paint the context and all these strange emotions and themes to disguise what they're actually doing because it's like they don't want to talk about what they're doing. I'm sure there's similar uh, context in, in various other habits of, of other consumers, but you see what I mean? Very much, very much. And it's it's funny because it's sort of this thing where we don't even necessarily want to be honest with ourselves uh, about why we why we want the watches. Sometimes people don't even know. They have this desire and it's confusing to them. I want this. I can't even rationalize it to my significant other who I'm <laughs> saying I'm about to spend a few thousand bucks to. And you've been you've witnessed this hundreds of times now, at least. Yeah, very much. But it's it's you know, they, they call it a rabbit hole, right? Like that's what people say. Like that's, and that's what it like, they like something and they want it. And, but yeah, to your point, you know, they want it cause it looks, you know, it's fashion, it, like fashionable or it gives them some sort of credibility among, among that, you know? So let's talk about colors because that's something which I think has been equally fascinating in terms of its trendiness. It used to be that you made a watch and you know, of course, you wanted to diversify the look and because retailers wanted variety. So you said, oh, we made a watch. Let's make a bunch of different dial colors. So it was like a built in thing. Of course, we're going to have different dial colors. And then what did they do? It was always the same standard dial colors. It was black and silver and maybe a couple of others. Now, today, finally, every dial color is getting <clears throat> treatment like it's its own model, meaning colors have become part of the product experience in a way that wasn't focused for so many years. And I want you to talk a little bit because you've, you've been through that transition and Oris is really dedicated to color in a lot of ways. Yep. How does that change things now that you are honestly like color fashion specialists as opposed to something that just, again, color was never in your job title? Yeah. I mean, I think it's something that uh, again, just comes down to desire of the market, right? I think people really have liked the, of late have liked color a lot like the past five years or so colors have been very yeah. strong and then being able to bring being able to bring out watches that kind of are really cool colors it's not an easy thing right so kind of making dials that that look really really good and we always get nice compliments for our dial colors and how we do it but i think it's it's still you know it's still a hit or miss sometimes too. Like you try things like not everything is successful. Not everything is, you know, not every color sells like every other color. So like, there's always, there's still a lot of that that goes on too. Um, so, I mean, I think it's just kind of find, trying to find the right thing, trying to find the, the right colors that are there, but, but having the ability and having the, you know, we could just do it. Like we put out a pink cotton candy watch, like, you know, we, if maybe if we were in another brand or another group or something that would not have been something that we could do, but being independent allows us to kind of just be free with our designs and what we want to do and how we want to do it. You know, a funny thing isn't just the color, but it's the inspiration of the color, right? Like sometimes yeah. it's the same color, like pink, I think is actually perfect. But, yeah. And there's dozens of ways of referring to as pink from salmon, right. Yep. To just the word pink. Like some yeah. people, some people want a pink watch, but can't fathom the word pink. Right. So you got to say something like cotton candy. But isn't <laughs> it funny how the, the, just the term has such a big part to do with the psychology? Yes. Yes. No, it's, it's true. And I think, you know, I think people have to be comfortable with what they're, you know, not everybody's comfortable wearing a pink watch, but there are plenty of people that will wear a pink watch and be happy with it or a bright blue one or whatever it is. But it's just, I think it's, again, the person that's wearing it has to be, you know, the confident in what they're, what they're doing. And, you know, and, but that, we've come a far way because again, 10 years ago, the idea that a men's watch brand was touting around, you know, uh, colors that you might see at like a preschool, like child-friendly colors and stuff like right. that, right? Right, Like right. people be like, wait, what, what's going on here now? It's like, hey, all you got is the standard boring colors. Like, <laughs> it's very interesting that we've come this far. And look, I remember uh, years ago when I would just write about a watch that was like, had like a white strap. 
people are like, oh, that's for that's for Miami right there. You know, like yeah, now exactly. the, the idea that a white strap is feminine is like it would never even enter your mind. Yeah. No, it's, it's true. We've, we've come a far, a long way, haven't we? And that's an, and that's another thing. Like strap colors, like strap colors are like, you know, everyone loves different colored straps now. People are desiring, like, they want a bright yellow strap or they want a bright blue strap or whatever. Like, it's it's definitely something that is 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 desired. And I think it's you know it depends on the parts of the world and it depends on you know um, different different cultures. But certainly, um, it's it's much more desired than it used to be. So you would agree that in America, amongst the average male buyer, there's so much more open mindedness right now to colors that, again, just a decade ago would have never even been on the menu. I I do agree with that. I do agree with that. But I think it's also a function of putting them out, right? Like how many times or how many years did we have, to your point, blue, black, silver, like, and then didn't do any of that. So you didn't necessarily know if people liked it because people didn't necessarily see any other watches like it. So now it's out there. So yeah, there's people like it. Will they always like it? Will it still be, you know, in style in, in 20 years? You know, probably not. It'll probably flip again and just, you know, go more conservative, but it's just kind of what you see. Right. I, I had this sort of funny idea, you know, years ago now already, but it's, it sort of stays in my mind where we went from this era of colors being kind of weird to colors being celebrated, right? So it was just the average thing was like, you know, the, the monochromatic watch. And then I'm waiting for the time where the big new watch is one which is black and white. Like no one thought they wanted it. And then it was like, black and white? I never thought of that. How cool. <laughs> you know? And it's like, Probably, yeah. and then we're all going to be like, what a concept, everyone. A mainly black watch. I mean, it's all this color. Wow. Such, such courage. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's going to happen, right? It will happen. It will. It will come back around. Everything will come back around. It's real. Yeah. It's, I mean, that, that's the great thing about colors. Is it's not like we're inventing new colors. We are inventing yeah. new ways to make uh, surfaces that have colors. And I think that's the exciting thing. Is yes, blue, green. It's always been yeah. around. But twenty years ago, even ten years ago, we didn't have all the industrial techniques um, to make watch quality materials, especially for the outside of watches, it takes so much wear and tear to have them in, in, in interesting colors. And not a lot of people get credit for it, but the amount of money that is made into ceramics being other colors, right? Yep. Carbon. Carbon's black, yet there's certain colored carbons. Like that's a chemistry fiction yeah. right there, right? That's crazy. No. You know, no, so I, it, it's exciting. To your, to your point, like I don't think people necessarily always appreciate just how much goes into making those sort of things and the technology behind it. Like I'll use our PPX laser, for example, right? Like that's, that's one that's of all different colors, but it's in, in essence, it has no color in the dial whatsoever. Like there's no pigment in the dial. It's just the way that the laser has cut it and the light is refracting from it. That makes the color the, the color that it is. So it's pretty, it's pretty cool. And, you know, again, you have to have an appreciation or have to understand it and then you appreciate it much more when, once it's there. But I think colors, yeah, definitely um, the technology behind them has, has definitely brought them more to the forefront as well. I noticed on the Oris website how, again, it's changed the design over a couple of years, um, but now you sort of have three major product areas. You have the watches, you have straps and you have merchandise, which you call love items, which is nice. And it's interesting because years ago, you never would have seen the stratification. You would have just seen watches, not always yep. available for purchase. Now there's a comfortable section to buy straps and things like that and merchandise. Um, talk a little bit about the evolution of the, you know, the Oris.ch store, online store, because it, 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 it's, you're always trying to do something a little bit different there. Yeah, I mean, we we um, we went live with e-commerce on our site back in 2018, so you know it's been about six or so years that we've done that, um, and yeah, I mean, I think it's evolved over time into terms of how it was done and how it is, but yeah, I think obviously logically watches were something that we offered for for sale um, first, and then. The other unique thing about if you buy something from Oris um, online, from our website, it actually comes from Switzerland. So it comes to you from Switzerland directly from the factory, packaged from the factory. So um, that was something we wanted to do that was maybe a little different than most um, 
And then we went into like the strap store, went online a couple of years ago as that was something that, you know, obviously people wanted to buy straps and the ability to do that. So we put that online. Um, and that's been, that's been reasonably successful for us as well. And then the idea of the love items or the kind of the merchandise that's happened with some of the things that we've done, the bear sweaters and things like that. And it's just grown a little bit. So that's a relatively new, um, new concept for us, but it's certainly something that people appreciate and like. So, and or still maintains a pretty robust network of, you know, authorized dealers. Oh, most definitely. I mean, I mean, you know, our business majority, the majority of our business is through our authorized dealers. I mean, the web website things are a small percentage of what we do. Um, but in today's world, like you have to have commerce, like it's just, just the way it is. Right. But, um, most, um, but most of our business is through our retail partners. Now, what's the what's the way of having the right line between those? Because a lot of brands have been, you know, required in a lot of ways to do both, have that network, but also sell themselves. Retailers obviously want to feel as supported and as confident as possible to sell and that, you know, interest will be channeled their direction. What are some of the things you do to make sure that, again, the retailers being as important as they are, are allowed to have their businesses thrive while at the same time you have an online store. I mean, it's, it's a question for many brands. I'm just curious how Oris has done it. Yeah. I mean, we, we do a couple of unique things I think that allow people to, um, you know, be part of the website, um, strategy. So for example, if you're a consumer and you want to buy something from Oris from the website, but you want to deliver it to say, you know, your store, um, your local retailer that carries Oris, you have the ability to do that. And then the retailer participates in part of the sale of that, of that watch. So we do that a little differently. Another thing we do is a lot of brands have these sort of boutique limited editions or product that they're, you know, they have their own retail network and then other parts of their network can't get it. It's only limited to that. So we also, it, much in the same way, allow, people to get um, the one we make every year is a Holstein edition. So much the same if a retailer wanted to get that for a customer, they could get it and they would participate in that sale. So we try to do things a little bit differently in that sense. And it seems, it seems to work. I mean, I think with anything, there's always some back and forth with, with somebody, somebody has an issue about something, but I think it, you know, for the most part, it's worked very, very nicely. And I think we, we are no, um, you know, we're known to support our retail partners. So I think that's something that we've always kind of kept, kept strong so one of the things which has been not not certainly defining but very popular over the last several years now has been we'll call it environmentalism sustainability this idea of social responsibility when it comes to brands that charge a lot of money for their products and different luxury watch brands or different luxury brands in general have had different approaches uh, you know, on the more high end side there's been what ethical gold and ethical diamonds and things like that um, you know, but at, at all at all price points, there's brands that are interested in it. Now, it's not just a feel good um, layer to the brand. It's not just sort of greenwashing. I think it comes from a genuine desire to want to do good and a genuine desire for brands to want to make an impact. Talk a little bit about not just Oris's, but your own take on on social responsibility and how has that manifested itself in some of the initiatives that have been important to you. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, just from the Oris perspective, first and foremost, I mean, I think we, we've we been a brand that's been very active in in kind of that sustainability and, and ocean conservation and all this stuff for many, for many years. You know, to your point, it's become very popular in our industry in the past, you know, five years or so. Everybody makes something that's sustainable or a strap or, they, you know, a turtle yeah, or yeah. somebody's doing that. Like, so I think we've really had the long history of being part of that and participating in that, um, over, you know, two decades of time. Um, I think then the other thing that we've done specifically with regard to sustainability is, you know, a few things, I think, you know, we became a carbon neutral watch brand. So we were the first carbon neutral watch brand, um, in the industry. Right. But quite honestly, to become carbon neutral is rather, is pretty easy, right? You, you measure your carbon, output and then you pay some, pay it off and you offset. basically offset it right so yeah. it's it's not really anything that's there but we also pledged to reduce our carbon footprint 10 percent a year over three years since that announcement in 2021 so um we put out a sustainability report every year that talks about our emissions of of carbon and what we do 
And um, our last sustainability report, we basically have um, we're 23% versus our goal of 27.1% over three years. So we we're ahead of our schedules. We reduced our carbon footprint by 16.5% last year. So, you know, and it's by taking action. So it's not just talking about these things, but it's really that to us was the way to kind of show that we're taking action about it. And, you know, from a, from a, from a watch manufacturer perspective, um, you know, we put out about 15, point, 15 tons of material. So it's not the material that's causing our carbon footprint. It's not our manufacturing processes that are causing our carbon footprint. It's things like business travel. It's things like packaging and logistics and that sort of stuff. So we've taken a lot of steps there as well. Like we've put out our new packaging is, um, you know, basically recycled um, paper and you know, making boxes that are foldable and more sustainably shipped. So it, it basically, we reduced our carbon footprint on our logistics side by using our new boxes by 50%. So, I mean, I think that's, those are the kind of actions that I think have made a difference for us in terms of social sustainability and sustainability in general. And really, again, showing our action, trying to take action and put money where our mouth is. Um, you know, personally, I think it's important to, uh, the social sustain, the sustainability side of things and be able to kind of act as good corporate citizens and do, you know, good things for the, for the world. Um, you know, our, our staff here in the U S like they rent, um, we have a rental policy of electric vehicles and, and that sort of thing. So I think, you know, we try to do that stuff to keep our footprint down and, and kind of keep that going. And is it, you know, is it always convenient? No, it's not necessarily always convenient, but it's certainly something that's important and, and able to do. And we're not perfect and we try to do it the best we can. So it's interesting. And I'm thinking about all that. And I guess you sort of hit on it a little bit, but I guess one of the things I've been trying to figure out is as a luxury brand, how do you actually make an impact or a difference? And I think that you pointed out it's it's as an example. Ultimately, a watchmaker is not going to be a heavy polluter in the scheme of industries. It's just not. It's not the type of company that, you know, if, if, if all these watchmakers cleaned up their act, we'd make a difference. No, they're, they're <laughs> bar- barely emitting as it is. But the visibility in optics is a little bit different story. And if you can lead through a good example, both in the, the corporate decision making as well as the individual team members work, um, you know, you, you hope to signal something because, you know, you've done it all. You've had watches that, um, you know, have when they're sold, part of the money goes to these organizations. You've actually invited people out to do cleanups and stuff like that. You as a company have made decisions to change, you know, your own, as you say, carbon footprint and output and stuff like that. Like Oris has experimented with a lot of different things. Some do more than others. You and your team are great to ask when saying, hey, guys, hey, Oris, we want to make an environmental impact. What do we actually do? You guys have tried it all. Yeah. No, and I, I think it, it is that. It's it's doing different things and trying trying different stuff that makes that makes sense and seeing how it how it goes down the way. And I and to the point about the messaging or the just you know, using um, our upcycle as an example. For those of you who don't know, we've made, you know, watch dials out of recycled PET plastic. We've also made um something called Bracenet, which was recycled and um, basically recovered ghost fishing nets from the ocean um, made into watch dials. So, you know, is the amount of plastic in our upcycle something that's going to be changing the world? No, it's not. It's having the conversation with people. It's the people that are buying luxury watches are the people that can make a difference and have the means by which to make changes that will make a difference. And I think that's how we see it using our global voice to tell those stories you know, tell that to tell that um, situation there. You have a new generation of diver. You were talking about the diver 65 as being this sort of, you know, era changing watch for, for Oris. Um, I understand you're at the very least giving it a facelift or, or changing things. This is, I'm guessing going back to what we were saying before, a thoroughly modern product skinned in a way to make it seem a little bit more classic um, but talk a little bit about why you're excited about this upcoming new diver and, and uh, what the, the the model consists of. Yeah, so there's um, it's a new diver. Um, it's a you know vintage inspired, but it's not called Diver 65. It's just the new Oris divers. Um, 
it comes with two. I'm excited because it has a few things. The, the water resistance of the watch has been increased, so it's um, basically going to be 200 meter water resistant itself. Um, it has an upgraded power reserve as well to it, and also it has um, a, both a bracelet and a rubber strap that come with the watch and they both have a quick change system to them so quick change tropical rubber and quick change um basic uh bracelet that goes with it as well and all for 2700 retail so the pricing is very strong i believe on them and i think there's three colors that are really cool colors that'll go and i think it's uh you know there's a there's a black, there's a blue, there's also a sand color as well. The blue is a little unique in the sense, but they're they're really nice pieces. So excited just to have them. Just out of curiosity, and again, I haven't taken a good look at them. Why why remove the Diver sixty five name and just go to Diver? Because I think it's it's trying to make the point of that it is not a vintage watch. It's something that has an inspiration, but it's kind of the next, it's taking the next step with that watch. And I think that's really was important to us to try to bring that across. And that's why it was not named Diver 65. So, and again, correct me if I'm, I'm not understanding the process here. This Diver 65 collection has been popular for a number of years. The whole point was to have a more simplified diver because Oris has always been strong with divers, but to have one that was a little bit smaller, thinner, more entry point, didn't necessarily have to have the same underwater performance, but needed to capture the spirit, and it seemed to make sense. It was very, very popular. Now you are, as I understand, probably maintaining more or less the same proportions, doubling the water resistance, um, having a movement which, in your opinion, is a good blend of affordability and performance. Uh, the the quick release system for the for the straps very common, wasn't existing. It what needed to be engineered, of course. Uh, especially for the case. So are, are, are these the sort of primary areas in the overall thinking? Yes. I mean, I think it was really to, to do that and bring something, again, of strong value, bring something that was attractive and, and looked good. Um, also give it, a, you know, some some upgrades, again, on the water resistance. Also, the, I didn't mention that the um, bezel insert ceramic. So, like, just kind of taking it up a notch, whereas... Before with the, the Diver 65, there was a, it was an aluminum um, top ring as well because it was more towards the, the actually the vintage side of it and the vintage piece of what that what that contained. So, yeah. So now, and again, this is interesting just to, to allow people to understand your process. You now have a a newly competitive product where you have a design that you know people like, and now you're get, basically giving as much modern features and things like that for the money but in a crowded space so you're very proud of your product you think it's going to offer a lot to people who who get to know it but as we agree the the diver space continues to be the most crowded what are what are your steps what do you do to make sure that the market understands what you've done differently and, and how long do you give it months years you know what are your what are your plans no, I mean, I think, you know, when, when we launch a new product, we always try to communicate the features of that product or what makes that unique and different. Um, so, you know, certainly we will be talking a lot about that and a lot about those. We train people, we train our retail sales people or the retail store people to understand the features and talk about those features as well. Um, we will have some video content around it, kind of just talking about how to use the, the features and, and show off how to use the strap and the quick change. So, you know, basically just do things that are there um, with that. Sorry, there's someone here. So basically do do those kind of things. So let's talk about um, the economy and consumer price sensitivity. You are someone who I think has your fingers on the pulse all the time. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you want to know what's going on with the retailers and sales on a daily basis. And you know more than anyone um, not only what's going on in consumer behavior, but how sensitive they are. Talk a little bit about the importance of meeting the consumer where their mind is at and what price sensitivity means for you know how a company needs to do business uh, in a time of shifting costs all over the place. Yeah, I mean, I think I think price sensitivity is is a very important thing, especially in our industry of 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 watches. And again, you know, people at the very high end of this industry. I wouldn't say have price sensitivity, right? I think that's just generally true in general. If they want something, they'll buy it. And if whatever it is, it's more about the 
collectability or the specialness of this it. This is hundred thousand dollar plus, really. Yeah, we're talking about really high end, but like in our price points and and sort of the middle price points, I think that's where this really comes into play. And you have to make sure that you have value and you kind of make something that's not you know terribly out of line or you know terribly um you know um how do I say it like just you don't ever want to take advantage of a customer or take advantage of pricing or things like that and really try hard to keep things in a way that that is fair for all and keep a percentage that's fair for all and all people. So I think that's that's kind of how we look at it. And then you got to look at compar- comparatively and comparative models and things like that. And where, where does this stack up? What does this offer? Um, not just in your you know, with a competitive science set, but also in your own collection, like how does this fall into what we're offering to people and what makes this different than say something that we have that exists. And then how does the pricing kind of speak to that? So that's, that's important as well. And that's such a crucial part of your overall strategy because you're doing a lot of in-person stuff. So you and your team have to communicate the price directly to the consumer, be able to respond to questions, concerns, thoughts, reactions of, of all types like that. Um, you know, I guess my last question is how do you train that part of it where you're, you, you inform people about the watch, inform people about the brand? What are some of the tips you give to your salespeople when it comes to discussing and explain the pricing? Well, I think it's just understanding the feet, like understanding, make sure that the products are understood, make sure the features are understood, make sure, you know, why this make, makes this like this watch has a clasp that, that does this and this clasp in, you know, many other models might be, you know, twice the price that it is in this model. So it's like kind of giving the, the right um, guidance on what, what the models and the watch features are and then how do they relate to other things and how does it go? I think that's the important part of it in that sense. And then obviously as things, as things get into the market and things uh, sell or things don't sell, like that's also, you know, kind of guides some things as well. So watches to make you smile. That's, that's the end of our show, VJ. I want everyone to go over to the oris.ch website uh, to see the latest products um, VJ, is there anywhere else on the internet you'd like to point people's attention to to learn more about what's going on with Oris or yourself? I think, yeah, I think that certainly uh, Oris.ch is where it's at. I am uh, myself, I'm VJ Geronimo, VJ.Geronimo um, on Instagram if you're looking. Um, so, and that's pretty much kind of the whole thing. Yeah, I mean, I think the website is the best place to get it. Oris on Oris on Instagram um, is also obviously our, our website, our main website as well our main Instagram channel, I should say. Thanks for listening. This has been the Superlative Podcast interview with Vijay Geronimo, CEO of Oris Americas. Vijay, thank you so much. Thank you, Aaron.